Okay. <laughs> For those of you who didn't recognize it, that's Fat Boy Slim, right? With a little bit of Greta Thunberg. And uh, the next one you probably know. Oh, Ralph, how I envy your optimism. There is no Springfield 50 years in the future. With global warming trapping the CO2 inside our poisonous atmosphere, our superheated oceans will rise, drowning our lowlands, leaving what's left of humanity baking in deserts that once fed the world. And in the new Nineveh, darkness falls. It is very rare that you can start a lecture with uh, Fat Boy Slim and Lisa Simpson. Uh, my name is Richard Toll. I'm going to talk about uh, the question that you see here. Is climate change an existential uh, threat? Um, and this is fairly topical. Uh, you've probably seen the protests uh, by Extinction Rebellion uh, in London and other places. Uh, just yesterday, it's still going on. Uh, today in Wilso, uh, over the next uh, two weeks. Uh, and of course, uh, Extinction Rebellion is so named because they rebel against the possible extinction of the human race. And this is uh, one of their uh, earlier uh, posters, earlier relative, they're only a year old, right? <coughs> um, and I'm going to take this literally, right? Uh, we are at university now, and that means that words have meaning. Um, she looks awfully good for a zombie, right? She did not literally die. Um, I realize that nowadays the language is that the word literally means that you put emphasis on what comes after, uh, but that's not how you use language precisely and of course precise language is what a university studies is all about <coughs> um, the people from extinction rebellion take extinction almost literally uh, this is he one of the founders themselves about what's happening for the future they've got another 50 60 70 years to live on this planet by that time there could be only a billion people left I mean, that's six billion people that have died from a starvation or been slaughtered in war. He seems to believe this, right? Six billion people not slaughtered in law, but slaughtered in war, of die or dying from uh, starvation. And this is one of the co-founders uh, of Extinction uh, Rebellion. He is definitely not the only one who proclaims this. Uh, you may have seen signs like this. You may have uh, held up signs like this. You'll die of old age. I'll die of climate change. Um, that's a fairly anonymous uh, person in the crowd. Um, <coughs> this is Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, who you may have heard of, right? I'm not a scientist, but I don't need to be uh, because the world scientific community has spoken and they have given us our prognosis. If we do not act together, we surely will perish. Um, again, existential uh, risk, right? Uh, Christine Lagarde, who is not an actor, uh, but uh, still the head of the International Monetary Fund and the incoming uh, head of the European Central Bank, uh, unless we take action on climate change, future generations will be roasted, toasted, fried, and grilled. Very similar uh, sentiment. Uh, this is Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, talking about climate change. Um, for those of you who've been to America, you would know Bill Nye, the science guy, because he's always on television trying to explain in a popular way natural science uh, to people. And this is how he depicts climate change, with a globe on fire, uh, which would be fairly detrimental uh, to everything living on that globe. Uh, <clears throat> here we have uh, Greta Thunberg again I don't want your hope, I don't want to be hopeful I want you to panic and act as if the house was on fire a popular message um, about uh, climate change millennials and people and you know Gen Z and all these folks that come after us 
are looking up and we're like, the world is gonna end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is, your, your biggest issue is how are we gonna pay for it? So this is Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, right? One of the rising stars in the Democratic Party. Uh, she quotes here that 12 years, uh, actually gets that wrong. She refers to a uh, Guardian article that appeared the year before, so it's 11 years, right? And uh, that is uh, the inset uh, that you see. Um, and that was the sub-editor's interpretation of a piece that was an interpretation of a, a report by the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body, that actually did not reach this conclusion at all, but this is how it sort of got translated into uh, political reality. We have 12 years uh, to save the world. Uh, she got a lot of flack uh, for this, uh, but does not seem to have taken that we are too hard. So because of the climate crisis, we only have a few months left. I love that you support the Green Deal, but it's not getting, you know, getting rid of fossil fuel is not going to solve the problem fast enough. A Swedish professor saying, you know, we can eat de dead people, but that's not fast enough. So I think your next uh, campaign slogan has to be this, we got to start eating babies. We don't have enough time. There's too much CO2. All of you, you're, you, you know, you're pollutant. Too much CO2. We have to start now, please. You are so great. I'm so happy that you really support a nuclear deal, but it's not enough. You know, even if we would bomb Russia, we still have too many people, too much pollution. So we have to get rid of the babies. That's a big problem. Just stopping having babies is not enough. We need to eat the babies. And this is very serious. Please give a response. Thank you. No, thank you, thank you. One of the things that's very important to us is that we need to treat the climate crisis with the urgency that it does present. Um, luckily, we have more than a few months. We do need to hit net zero in several years. Um, but I think we all need to, to, to understand that there are a lot of solutions that we have um, and that we can pursue and that if we act in a positive way, there is space for hope. There's, we are never beyond hope. Okay. Um, the first woman that spoke was an actress, a very good actress, right? I mean, it's one thing acting for a camera. It's more difficult to act uh, in front of people on a stage, but it's extremely difficult to be an actor in a room full of people who sit very close to you and directly interact with you. She was an actor, this was a spoof. Uh, the picture that you see here is of course Jonathan Swift, right? Who in his modest proposal suggested that we start eating uh, the children of the poor people, right? To uh, <coughs> help against overpopulation. Uh, the response of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is she actually doubles down on what she said before, right? No, 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 it's not months that we have to solve this problem. We have years to solve this problem, not decades, years is what she said. Um, how she responded to this woman, did she think she was being spoofed? Did she think this woman was serious? Did she think this woman uh, had a mental uh, health problem? Uh, that is the suggestion that she gave afterwards. But it's, it's very clear that, I mean, they've admitted it by now, that first woman who spoke was an actress, right? Uh, who spoke from a script so as to uh, ridicule uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <coughs> the notion that we have only 12 or 11 years uh, to save the planet is absolutely not new. Uh, this is from CNN. It's a different number, actually. We have 100 days to save the world. Uh, but for those of you with uh, good eyesight, this is from 2015, right? And actually, if you go back further in time, it's always 5 to 12, right? We always have had only a few years um, to solve this problem. Those deadlines come and go and they're replaced by uh, new deadlines. And it actually goes back way in the past. News had just come over. We had five years left to sign. News guy wept when he told us Earth was really dying. Five years, that's all we got. Um, for
for those of you who didn't recognize him, this was David Bowie when he was young. And for those of you who don't have a sense of fashion history, this is what people dressed like in the 70s, right? Uh, and he was serious. That around that time, people thought we only had a very short time left. Um, <clears throat> that was for other reasons than climate change, uh, but this notion that a sense of urgency about environmental problems has been with us for a long time. Um, the, the thing that I'm going to talk about is the question, is climate change really a, an existential threat? Um, and the examples that I showed you suggest that there's many people who think that way. Now, that is anecdotal stuff. What does that mean, right? A guy holding up uh, a placard in the crowd. Does he really believe what he's saying there, or is he trying to impress his girlfriend or something? You don't know. Um, what we're looking at here are the results from uh, a survey, a fairly large one, 28 countries, done by uh, a professional uh, survey company, YouGov, uh, and they ask questions uh, about all sorts of stuff. Uh, what would climate change uh, do to you? And uh, the bottom question, for those in the back, is the extinction of the human race is a question that they asked, and this is data from last, no, from this summer. Uh, and the scale here is from nobody believes it, zero percent, to everybody expresses this opinion. And then the color codes are in the sort of bluish Asian and Pacific countries, in the reddish Middle Eastern countries, and in the uh, greenish um, we have European countries and the USA. And what you see is that in our place, yeah, 20 to 55 percent of people really believe that climate change, or say in the survey, that climate change is an existential threat. And that is what I'm going to talk about. Is this true? Um, word of warning, no safe places. I'm going to look at three particular assertions. I can take you through a much longer list, um, but I think uh, that would get boring in the end. So I'm going to talk at, uh, look at uh, three different questions, three different assertions. We're all going to drown, we're all going to starve, and we're all going to fry. And I'll take them uh, in that order, starting with we're all going to drown because of sea level rise. Uh, so this, you recognize, this is a map of Northwestern Europe, right? There's the British Isles, the Netherlands, a bit of uh, most of Germany, all of Denmark, a bit of France, a bit of Norway, right? Uh, and this is the current map. This is uh, after uh, one meter of sea level rise. And you see that the map changes, right? Bits of the Netherlands are disappearing, bits of northern Germany are disappearing, bits of East Anglia are disappearing. Uh, this is after five meter sea level rise. Um, and this is after 50 meters of sea level rise, and by now the map is very different, right? But this is a scary picture, this is a scary future. 50 meters sea level rise, that's roughly East and, uh, Antarctica melting. Um, this doesn't look good, right? If this is the future, then you have reason to be uh, worried. Now this is for um, the North Sea Basin. Look at uh, worldwide, uh, we have sea level rise uh, vertically, we have essentially distance, vertical distance uh, from the coast uh, horizontally. Uh, Venice will be the first to go, followed by Los Angeles, Amsterdam, Hamburg, St. Petersburg next, San Francisco, Lower Manhattan, then South London, actually Westminster is down here, uh, but this is the much larger bit of London, Shanghai, Edinburgh, New Orleans, New York, London, all of London by now all of Taiwan gone. We're all going to drown, right? Um, and here in the insets you're looking at what the world map would look like. So this is the world map as it is now, and then here you see things disappearing, whole bits of Canada uh, are gone, and then there, oh my gosh, uh, a whole lot of Western Europe Scandinavia is simply gone, right? And what we're looking at there is still physically possible. 
and not just physically possible, it has happened in the past. The world that we're looking at here is a world with all the glaciers gone, a much warmer world, so sea level has expanded, Greenland has completely melted, West Antarctica has slid into sea, and East Antarctica has completely melted. And then indeed we're looking for the world as a whole at something like 60 to 70 meters of sea level rise. And because of the poles are actually, in particularly the South Pole, has a lot of mass, so it has a lot of gravitational pull. If global sea level rises by 70 meters, but the southern ice cap is gone, then you have a redistribution of waters over the planet, and in Europe that adds another 30 meters to sea level. So local sea level rise, European sea level rise, would be about 30 meters above the global average. So here we're looking at 100 meters of sea level rise. Um, and this is essentially the same picture that shows it, but now over time, this is done by uh, paleo, uh, giant, uh, paleo geoscientists, the world's always a bit peculiar. Uh, so zero is today, that makes sense. Positive numbers are in the past, and negative numbers are in the future. Um, so when we came out of the last ice age, we actually have seen 150 meters or so of sea level rise. Uh, to the point that we are today and we can expect another 50 or 100 meters uh, into the future as Greenland and Antarctica uh, melt. The crucial issue here is of course time scale. This is going to happen in 10,000 years so let's blow that up a little bit and look a little bit closer to home. Yes we can speak about 7 meters sea level rise if we restrain our time uh, frame a little bit. But then still we're talking about <coughs> the end of the millennium. If we're talking about the end of the century, of this century, there's somewhere here, the sea level rise is actually restricted to half a meter. That's up to my knees. Now, you guys are young, you're probably going to see the year 2100, not me. I'm not going to make it, you're probably going to live uh, to see that, most of you at least. And then if you start worrying about your children, then perhaps a meter of sea level rise is what you should be able to deal with, right? So those dramatic scenarios, like large areas simply disappearing, Yes, that's physically possible, and it may or may not happen in the very long <coughs> run, but not during your lifetime, and not during the lifetime of your, or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. Right? So that is a perspective that needs to be kept in mind. Now another thing that needs to be kept in mind um, is of course that we have had sea level rise in the past, um, and some people are worried uh, about its uh, consequences. So here we're looking at a picture um, of what I think should be called Hulu Malay, uh, which is an island in the Maldives. And these two pictures are 20 years apart. And in those 20 years, we may have had 10 centimeters of sea level rise or so. And you see a dramatic difference, right? A build-up area and complete emptiness, right? Void of any human occupation. Now, you may think this demonstrates the impact of climate change, that even a little bit of sea level rise can have devastating consequences. But I only told you that these two pictures are 20 years apart. I did not tell you which came first. This is 20 years ago. This is today, right? So a country like the Maldives, which likes to go around the world and tell everybody just how vulnerable they are to climate change and sea level rise in particular, and that sort of makes sense. The highest point on the Maldives, the highest natural point on the Maldives, is only one meter above sea level. And that is something that we may expect by the year 2150 or so, and then the highest point would be gone. But that is if the Maldivians don't respond to sea level rise, if they just sit on their island 
and watch the sea rise and do nothing about it. It is a very strange response that a human would just sit there and let disaster fall. And particularly if it comes to such things as water management and sea level rise. We actually don't know who invented the dike. We do know that the ancient Chinese and the ancient Sumerians knew how to build dikes 5,000 years BC, right? 7,000 years ago. That's the oldest archaeological evidence we have of people actively controlling waters, actively protecting themselves against floods. And why do we think that somehow 7,000 years later we have forgotten that? It's a very strange assumption to make, but it's an assumption that goes behind a lot of the more dramatic uh, projections of the impact of sea level. <coughs> and this is what the Maldivians did in 20 years' time, right? They took an island, it was barely an island, a bit of coral, a bit of uh, sand, and build it up and build a city there and build an airport there, right? And they're no fools, right? They know the projections of sea level rise, so they made sure that all the new built stuff that they put there is one, two meters above sea level rise, and they will be fine for the next hundred years, right? So the human response to the threat, in this case a projected threat, far into the future leads us to uh, protect ourselves. <coughs> so no, we're not all going to drown, not in our lifetime, and not while we know how to protect ourselves, how to protect our coast. Not saying that this is not an issue, right? I mean, coastal protection is expensive. Coastal protection can go wrong. But it's not that we're going to sit back and let, our, let uh, the sea swallow us, right? Um, the second thing I said I was going to talk about is we're all going to starve. <coughs> and that is what Roger Hallam said, right? Uh, six billion people will die of starvation and the um, wars uh, of scarcity uh, that follows. What you're looking at here is a um, whole bunch of results, right? And from uh, the last assessment report, or the latest assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, for the three major crops, uh, so that's uh, maize at the top, wheat in the middle, rice uh, at the bottom. So these are the three crops where we get most of our calories from, we being humankind. Um, so this is essentially what feeds the world, right? Uh, for temperate regions and for tropical regions. Uh, the red dots and the blue dots are primary studies, and then the lines that you see is sort of a meta-analysis, a study that combines the results of previous uh, studies, and that sort of suggests uh, the pattern. Um, and if you look at wheat uh, in the tropics, for instance, then what you see is, uh, for those who can't read the scale, up to minus 60%. So where you now get 10 bushels from your land in the future with climate change, and this is warming uh, of around 5 degrees, uh, you would get only 4 bushels of wheat. Right? That's how you should read this. Uh, it seems fairly, fairly dramatic, right? Losing more than half of your crop. Now that is wheat, and the reason that wheat responds in this way is, of course, partly because wheat is a cold-loving crop. Um, if you look at maize, which is much more heat tolerant, you see a negative response, but more muted. Um, if you look at rice, which is, of course, a heat-loving crop, uh, you see a negative response, but much more muted. But still, you see a negative response. Um, but we're talking about a crop loss of 5, 10, 20 percent, right? So that's already much less dramatic than uh, the 50 to 60 percent uh, that we saw before. <coughs> now, the difference between the blue and the red 
is that the red studies assume that farmers will continue to plant the same crops and the same varieties on the same lands that they always have and will apply the same fertilizers and the same pesticides that they always have will plant at the same time will irrigate at the same time as they always have and will harvest at the same time as they always have that even though these farmers observe that the climate is changing, they see no need to change their behavior in response to the climate change. And even if their crops keep failing and failing and failing, they keep trying to do the same thing again and again and again. Um, any of you with a farming background, this is not what farmers do, right? Uh, they are fairly clever people if it comes to what is going on, and fairly observant people if it comes to uh, what's going on on their farm, right? Um, so in blue, you're looking at those studies where farmers are allowed in the models to respond to whatever is going on on their farms. Now what you see is, with the exception of this one here, uh, that that actually alleviates the problem, right? It makes a 50% crop loss into a 35% crop loss, still pretty bad, uh, but not as bad. Outside of the tropics, it actually changes a negative into a positive. Farmers are actually able to make use of the new opportunities, the longer growing seasons, uh, and so on and so forth. <coughs> the exception uh, is here. Um, you haven't done a whole lot of statistics yet. This is sample selection. The sort of the best brains that work for the IPCC, that work for the United Nations uh, on this, hadn't quite figured out what to do with selection bias. The little numbers that you see there shows the number of studies that went into the meta study, that went into the line, and that shows you immediately that this is not comparing like with luck. Had they restricted the sample to those where you have both with and without, farmers response with and without adaptation they would have gotten a positive signal of adaptation because farmers are not so stupid that they make life worse for themselves <coughs> um, so that is one part of the picture you will allow farmers and these are only on farm changes right this is farmers changing their cultivars changing when to irrigate and that sort of stuff this is not a farmer switching from wheat to maize as the temperature goes up, which would be a sensible response. Uh, but it mutes and even changes uh, the sign of the impact. impact. Uh, there's two other things going on. <coughs> I talked about a 50% loss in yield, a 50% uh, loss of your harvest at five degrees, which is 150, 200 years in the future. Um, what we're looking at here are crop yields and crop yields over the last 120 years or so uh, for a whole bunch of uh, places. And this is uh, the world uh, average for as far as we have data. <coughs> the most spectacular one is maize, right? Where the average yield used to be one ton per, a per hectare, sorry. Uh, it is now eight and a half tons per hectare. So technological progress has increased yields eightfold over a period of 120 years. Now if you take that into perspective and then say, well, over another 100 years, we're going to do an eightfold increase again, and then climate change is going to take away half of that, right? then we actually have the same yield as, uh, no, <laughs> uh, then we have a fourfold increase in food production, right? And all of a sudden that halving of crop yields, which is actually the most pessimistic scenario that we saw of climate change, is no longer there. Now, <coughs> maize is spectacular, right, an eightfold increase, and this is a number of factors, right? This is uh, better irrigation, these are fertilizers, these are pesticides, and this is better varieties, right? Breeding, and nowadays genetic uh, manipulation, right? 
Um, but there's, I mean, some people worry that these, so this is, so this is the yield and this is the annual change in the yield. And what you see is that for some crops, this is going negative nowadays. That actually we're getting worse at growing food. Um, now my agronomists uh, and agricultural uh, economics friends tell me that these negative effects are because we grow too much food. And for farmers, it makes no longer sense, definitely farmers in the US and in Europe, it no longer makes sense to maximize production because that just drives down prices. And really what they're going for are niche varieties, are sort of environmentally friendly and nature friendly crops that do a little bit worse in terms of weight that you get off your farm but actually do better in terms of the amount of money you would get for this. And that explains why these trends, these uh, increases are not as spectacular as they used to be if you just focus on volume. <coughs> this of course immediately implies that, yeah, I mean, by now farmers have shifted towards maximizing the revenue rather than the volume uh, that comes out. And therefore they go for lower yielding varieties that that's a higher price, but of course they can switch back, right? And agricultural universities can switch back from sort of like improving the environment to maximizing the amount of food that comes up the farm, right? Uh, so this is not sort of a God-given uh, thing. This is something that can be reversed. <coughs> so that's the second part of the story. The third part is this particular map. And this is a map of the yield gap. Um, and you recognize the map, right? Uh, the scale uh, that you're looking at is the attainable yield achieved. Now, how is this calculated? Um, this is essentially the actual yield, how much harvest you get from your field, relative to what a model farm does working in the same climate on the same soil. So basically every country in the world has these agricultural extension services where a university or a government uh, agency sort of has a couple of farms where they try out new crops and new pesticides and new ways of irrigation and God knows what else they're trying in order to improve things, right? And they do that to the best as they can, scientifically managed farms. And then the lessons that are learned from that operating farm are then taken to the commercial farmers and they are being taught about how to improve their stuff, right? And that's basically going on uh, everywhere across the planet. And what you're looking at here is the ratio of what the model farm does to what the actual farm does, the uh, commercial farm. Um, and if you look at Europe, you see that basically English farmers are as good as scientific farmers. They get the maximum, the maximum possible out of their farm, right? If you know farmers, you actually would realize that many, many of them have higher degrees in bio geochem biochemistry or in agricultural and biology nowadays, right? These are not dumb people. They are typically highly educated and very sophisticated in what they do. And that explains why the yield gap in Europe is 10% or so. <coughs> if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, there we're looking at the reds and the yellows, right? Mostly reds. And in the <coughs> worst parts, actual subsistence farmers get only 10% of what a model farm gets in the same climate, on the same soil, right? So this is not technological progress that I'm talking about. This is about people m being inframarginal, being far away from what is technically possible, not in some future, but now, right? Um, <coughs> and if you say, well, climate change is going to halve the crop, you're here, but if you say we're going to move these people to what is technically possible, 
then you have a tenfold increase in their yield, right? And then you can take away half, and they're still growing more food. Still growing five times as much food, right? Four times as much food. Don't overdo it. Um, now, why is this? Why are farmers so poor at, in Africa, so poor at growing crops? Not because they're dumb, but because they don't have access to advanced seeds, right? So they're just growing using the seeds from the leftovers from last year's harvest, rather than by commercial optimized seeds, uh, because they can't afford fertilizer. And why can't they afford this if it's so valuable to them, right? You can increase your yield tenfold. If you can increase your harvest tenfold, that's worth a lot of money. And the reason for that is that, not that they don't know this or don't know how to do it, but it's because they're poor, so they need all the money they have to feed their children and send them to school, and after they've done that, there's nothing left, and typically they don't have a title on their land, they can't prove that the land that they till is theirs, and therefore they cannot go to the bank and say, give me a loan to buy a bag of fertilizer because they have no collateral to underwrite that loan, right? So those are the reasons, uh, some of the reasons that um, farmers um, do so very poorly relative to what is possible, right? Um, which suggests that, yeah, <laughs> if we are worried about the food supply in Africa, do we worry about climate change or do we worry about development, right? And climate change is in factor two, and the development is a factor ten, right? And true, if these people in a hundred years' time are still as capital constrained as they are now, then climate change is a big problem for them. But if they're not, if they have access to modern technology, if they have functioning capital markets, then we're talking about a much smaller problem of climate change, right? <coughs> so the third thing I wanted to talk about is we're all going to fry. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map, again, uh, the number of days projected to exceed potentially deadly heat levels per year by the year 2100. Uh, and in the very dark very dark red, almost black. Um, heat is deadly for 350 days per year or more, basically always, right? Uh, so that's fairly serious. That's uh, Sumatra, right? Uh, Sulawesi, that large part of the Amazon, uh, Congo, those sort of places. Uh, this looks uh, scary. Now, what is deadly heat? We are warm-blooded animals. The, our body temperature inside has to be 37 degrees. And that is how we have evolved, right? That is what our uh, inner body has to be. And um, if it gets too hot, then at first you start feeling uncomfortable. But if you get sort of like beyond the 40, 41 degrees, I'm talking Celsius here, right? Um, your organs begin to fail, right? You're simply losing bodily functions and if you get to 41 degrees, you're basically dead. And similarly, if your body temperature drops below 35, then parts of your body simply begin to fail, right? Um, and that is a a thing that we share with all warm-blooded animals, that we have to keep the core of our body uh, around that temperature. Uh, and if not, we're uh, in trouble. <coughs> and what do you do when it gets hot? You start to sweat, right? So that is a way of cooling down your body. Essentially what you do is you evaporate water and the act of evaporation cools down uh, your body and keeps it at an acceptable uh, temperature. Um, now, there's one obvious issue there. If the air temperature goes up, then your body temperature wants to follow and you need to sweat more, right? You're probably familiar with that. Um, 
of course if you live in a very humid environment then it doesn't quite work because we cool our body by evaporating sweat and if there's a lot of water vapor in the air already then that simply doesn't work as well uh, and you get to uh, much higher temperatures particularly in the very humid uh, Southeast Asia or the very humid uh, parts of the South uh, East of the US right so that is wet heat and there's also dry heat you probably have all have heard uh, of Death Valley right why is Death Valley called Death Valley because you die there in dry heat if dry heat hits 55 degrees Celsius and you are in there the cells of your body start breaking down your body starts to disintegrate at 55 degrees and if you spend more than two hours in that valley you're dead right and of course if the temperature goes up we would have those conditions more often right so we're all gonna fry <coughs> now this is um, a study that was published in the proceedings of the National Academy uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences of the United States um, I won't give you its abbreviation um, and it projects <coughs> fairly dramatic consequences in the future right by the year 2100 large parts of the earth would be uninhabitable essentially you simply could not go outdoors let alone do work outdoors right if this projection is right uh, but then if we look at the fine print what do they project for the year 2018 or 2019 they project that at the moment 30 percent of the world's human population is exposed to such deadly conditions each year that doesn't make any sense right i mean the death rate is not 30 percent at the moment right at the end of this year one third of your classmates won't be dead i can guarantee you that it doesn't make any sense right so if they get the year 2018 wrong why would we believe what they say about the year 2100 so there's something very wrong with the number that they're projecting uh, but again there's other things uh, going on what you're looking at here um, is the sales of residential air conditioning <coughs> in the year 2016 um, yeah, the bars that you see is just total numbers the dots that you see floating is uh, units per uh, thousand people what you see is that in a place like China uh, in 2016 three years ago they sold 42 million uh, air conditioners but this is not the number installed no this is the number sold right uh, if you've been to Beijing recently or to Shanghai recently then you would notice that basically everybody is air conditioning nowadays if you were there 10 years ago unlikely you would have noticed that almost nobody is air conditioning right a uh, similar story um, smaller scale in places uh, like Delhi um, this is sort of uh, same story uh, per capita income <coughs> on the uh, vertical axis um, and then on the on the horizontal axis sorry and on the vertical axis uh, air conditioning penetration um, and then in the color codes that you see the blue are the very cold countries the red are the very hot countries and what you see is that in the hotter places if your income sort of hits twenty five thousand uh, dollars per person per year and you're still poorer than Portugal you actually hit a hundred percent air conditioning penetration uh, in homes right um, if you project that into the future uh, and this is work by the uh, International Energy Agency you see that um, essentially because of the growth in income you ex they expect large uh, or fairly pronounced penetration of uh, air conditioners different types in uh, residences right and they actually go but it's so this is million units uh, sort of billion uh, on that axis and on this axis they sort of get uh, a penetration rate of 60% or so by 2050 
of course, a scenario dependent on stuff assuming future economic growth. Uh, and this is the same for households by region. And you see sort of like rapid expansion in China, but then China saturates. Uh, and later on, a rapid expansion of air conditioning uh, in India. So this is residential. And here we have commercial. So this is where people uh, work and very much uh, the same uh, story where they projected by the year 2050 85% or so of office buildings and factories will be air conditioned. And then of course you take away those very real physiological stories that yes, there is a limit to the amount of heat your body can take, but if you can spend sort of the hottest times of the day in the year indoors, air conditioned, this is not a threat to your health. It's costly because those air conditioners don't run for free and they don't give them away, right? You need to buy them and you need to put the electricity in. So they don't come for free, but you won't lose your life, right? So I've done three of these scare stories. Uh, I can do more of them, but it can just get boring uh, because the story is always the same. So is climate change an existential threat? No. Not literally, right? Uh, there's nothing in the literature that suggests human extinction or large-scale mortality, or even medium-scale mortality. And the basic mechanisms there are known, right? I mean, if you look at where humans live, some live uh, uh, on the pole, some live on the equator, some live in the rainforest, some live in the desert. So the human can survive in many different climates. Hot, cold, dry, wet. And as a species, we've made it through four ice ages. Cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, right? And we survived all that. And most of that, we survived in much more primitive technology than we have currently at our disposal. And, <coughs> and we are, as a species, the ultimate uh, generalists, right? We must better able to adapt to our environment than any other species. And of course, by now we have a great ability to adapt our, envir our environment to our needs, right? Um, so no, climate change is not an existential threat. Now, before you start throwing things at me, um, climate change is a problem, right? And that's what I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, bit. <coughs> what you're looking at here is a complicated graph. Um, and it conveys a number of messages, but first let me tell you what is on the graph. On the horizontal axis, we're looking at the change in the global mean surface air temperature relative to the year 1750. Um, should I pause at this moment and give you a 10 minute break, or should I just barrel on? People say, Give us a 10 minute break and then explain what is on this graph. Okay. Okay. So, uh, before the break, uh, we, I talked, you didn't say much, uh, about the question whether climate change is an existential threat. And my conclusion was no. Um, but I did end with saying climate is a problem, uh, particularly in poorer countries. And I was just going to start on that. And then I realized that a break would be good, right? Um, so what does this picture show? <coughs> and it shows a whole lot of things. Um, so the first thing uh, I need to do is tell you what is on the axis, right? So uh, on this axis, the horizontal one, we have the change in the global mean surface air temperature since pre-industrial times, say 1750. Uh, so the zero means we are 250 years uh, in the climate past. Um, and then on the uh, vertical axis, we have the welfare equivalent income chains. It's a bit of a mouthful, right? Uh, so what does this mean? Well, if you take the average of the blue dots around two and a half, which is 1.3, what this means is that if the world were to warm by two and a half degrees, 
then the average person on the planet would feel as if she had lost 1.3% of her income. <coughs> it's not saying that she would lose 1.3% uh, of her income, but that she would feel as if she had lost. Right? Um, that's an important distinction. Uh, so losing 1% of your income would make you feel bad, right? And climate change would, of 2.5 degrees warming, would make you feel just as bad. And I emphasize this because it's not a loss of income, right? Some of the things that are going on with climate change, for instance, if you worry about sea level rise, then what you're going to do is build dikes. And if you're going to build dikes, then you're going to spend money. And if you're going to spend money, then you actually increase GDP, right? Because you're spending stuff, and you create jobs in uh, dike building and dike design and all that sort of stuff. So that raises incomes and that raises GDP. But dikes, I grew up in the Netherlands, are pretty stupid things, right? They're pretty useless, they're ugly, uh, they get in the way. You don't want them, right? So they don't contribute to welfare, but they do contribute to a traditional measure of economic activity, GDP, right? So that's why I say you feel as if you had lost 1% or 1.3% of your income. Um, but uh, it's not that you actually uh, lost it. Uh, so that is what is on the axis, and that is how you should uh, read these numbers. The blue dot, there's 27 of them, are all the primary studies uh, of the total economic impact of climate change that have been published. And then the red curves are sort of the best fit curve through these uh, blue dots. And that suggests uh, the overall pattern. Uh, <coughs> so what do we learn? And this is the sum total of our knowledge of the impacts of climate change uh, at the global average level. So what does this uh, tell us? Well, actually, what you see is that the initial effects of climate change may well be positive. Why would that be? Right? I mean, everybody in the media is always telling us that climate change is a catastrophe. Well, there's three basic reasons why the initial impacts of climate change are positive. The first is if winters are warmer, you need less money to heat your home. And that is a positive, right? Uh, second, in temperate countries, actually many more people die in winter due to cold than due to heat. And if winters get less cold, you would have less cold stress related uh, illnesses. And that's a big positive. Now you may think that hardly anybody dies of hypothermia, right? a few drunken pools every decade, uh, but hardly anybody ever dies of hypothermia. That's not the main cause of cold-related death. The main co cause of cold-related death is flu. So what do we do in winter? We stay indoors. If we stay indoors, we're closer to other people, and that means that all sorts of infectious diseases run rampant. And if winters get warmer, we will spend more time outdoors, farther away from other people, and therefore we will have less flu and other infectious diseases. Um, and that is the second reason. And the third reason uh, that the initial impacts of climate change may be positive is that CO2 is plant food. The reason that climate changes is because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, and if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, that means that plants can grow faster, because what plants do is they take CO2 out of the air, dump the oxygen back into uh, the air because they don't like it but we do uh, and they keep the carbon to make leaves and stems and roots and that sort of stuff right and that's what plants do uh, so more co2 means faster plant growth it also means that plants become more efficient in their water use uh, because as they uh, take co2 out of the atmosphere they have to open their stomata that means they evaporate water and that is, of course, another building block of the carbohydrates, also known as leaves and stems and roots. Uh, and, but if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, they can keep their stomata closed for longer. That means they lose less water, and that means that they become more drought resistant. So initially, climate change may be positive. There's a range of positive effects. <coughs> but I hasten to add that these initially positive impacts are largely sunk. If you're looking at where is the turning point, 
obviously everything is uh, pretty much uncertain and but it seems that incrementally things start t turning for the worse at around 1.1 degree uh, Celsius above pre-industrial and that is maybe where we are now certainly where we will be in the year 2030 and there's nothing we can do about climate in 2030 anymore because of the very slow workings of the oceans and the atmosphere and that sort of stuff that essentially these initial benefits are independent of our decisions about current and future emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and that means that technically they're sunk benefits they will come at us regardless of our policy choices right <coughs> So the positive but irrelevant uh, for policy. Uh, the second thing uh, that you notice is that, yeah, the initial impacts may be positive, but in the longer run, the negative impacts of climate change start to dominate the positive ones. It's not that the positives will go away, but the negative impacts will become much larger. So that's the spread of tropical diseases, that is heat stress, that is sea level rise, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and what we see is that things get progressively worse as the planet uh, warms. Um, the third uh, thing that we notice from this graph is that <coughs> these studies actually roughly agree. Um, and I, I won't have time to take you, and this is also not the place, to take you through the various methods that people have used uh, to estimate these numbers very different people using very different methods getting roughly the same results and uh, there's agreement uh, on the effect size and that is actually a telling agreement that even though you see some dispersion there the order of magnitude is always the same and the order of magnitude is a few percent of GDP for two and a half degrees of warming or three degrees of warming now what does that mean, right? And this is a true welfare impact, right? Uh, so what is uh, to, to a few percent of GDP? It's a year of economic growth, right? The economy expands per capita, if you're in Europe, uh, by one or two percent per year. And two and a half, and that's a positive uh, thing. And climate change will knock two percent off. But it's two and a half degrees of warming, so that is towards the end of the century. So really the order of magnitude that you're looking at here is that a century of climate change is about as bad as losing a year of economic growth. <coughs> that is what these studies say. Which is not the message you would get in the newspapers or on the telly, right? Um, which immediately makes that climate change is not the biggest problem of humankind, right? If this number is true, I mean, the people of Greece in the Eurozone crisis lost a third of their income in five years' time. And a third of your income in five years is bigger than 1% of your income in 100 years, right? And the people in Syria wish they had the problems of the people in Greece, right? Um, so climate change is not the biggest problem of humankind. Climate change is also not the biggest environmental problem of humankind. You project the death toll of spreading of disease like malaria is measured in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million, by the end of the century. This year, 8 million people will die because of air pollution, both indoor and outdoor. And 8 million, is big, 8 million in 2019 is bigger than 1 million in 2100. Right? That is what these numbers mean. <clears throat> not to say that climate change is not a problem, but perhaps it is sometimes exaggerated by people. Now, the number that I gave you of 1% uh, or a few percent, that is an understatement, right? Because if you look at the confidence interval, and this is only the 67% confidence interval uh, that you're looking at, you see that that is actually pretty wide. And you also see that's asymmetric. That is, negative surprises 
are much more likely than positive surprises of equal magnitude but opposite sign, obviously. Right? Uh, and the reason for that is that there's scary stories about climate change. But there's no positive stories, there's no paper out there that predicts that because of climate change we all will become blissfully happy. That doesn't make any sense and nobody has said that, not even nobody in their right mind, no, nobody has said that. Whereas you can think of really scary stories about climate change. But there are negative surprises and the scare story that at the moment is freaking people out is that the permafrost is melting in Siberia and Canada and places like that. Now, they think, well, there's hardly anybody living there, so what do we care, right? And of course, pipelines will get damaged because if you build a pipeline assuming that the ground is always frozen and then the ground is no longer frozen, then yes, your pipeline will uh, subside and break. And the same is true for the roads that you build there. The same is true for the houses that you build there. They will sink into the earth, right? Uh, if the permafrost melts, and that may be considered a problem for the people living there, uh, or for the environment, if you're talking about a pipeline. Uh, but the other thing that is going on is that if the permafrost melts, then the stuff that is frozen in the permafrost also thaws, right? And there is reason to assume that there are certain viruses and bacteria that have been frozen there for thousands of, ye of years or longer get unfrozen and are still viable, right? And we know that certain viruses can survive thousands of years of freezing. And God knows what is what sort of awkward and awful diseases are frozen in the permafrost, right? And we would have no resistance, right? Because it would be tens or hundreds of generations ago that we would have been exposed as humans to those diseases. So that's scary stuff, right? Do we know this for a fact? No, this is not something that you would put in the central scenario, but it would be something in the worst case scenario. And that is the reason why negative surprises are so much more likely than positive surprises. <coughs> and if you start correcting for this uncertainty, then perhaps it would be wiser to say that a century of climate change is about as bad as losing a decade of economic growth. And you can ask the people in Japan what it's like to use lose a decade of economic growth. Or you can ask the people in Europe, right, what that's like. <clears throat> now, all of this is at the global average. Uh, what I'm going to do now is look at the two and a half degrees warming, say 2080, uh, and take a cross section across the world. Um, same data, same methods, uh, but just a different depiction of uh, the results. Um, so what you're looking at here is welfare equivalent income change on the vertical axis still and on the horizontal axis we're looking at per capita income in the year 2010. And the poorer countries are to your left and the richer countries are to your right. And you see very clearly, and this is a logarithmic scale, right? Uh, so this is not a linear relationship but an exponential one. Um, um, and what you see is very clearly that the big impact, the big negative impacts fall on poor countries rather than on rich countries. And actually you see that in rich countries you see mostly positive impacts, right? Now, there's three reasons for this. <coughs> the first one is exposure. If you go to a country like Ghana, most people work in agriculture. Most of agriculture and uh, most of economic output comes from agriculture. That means that they are directly exposed to the weather and therefore to climate change. If you take a country like the UK, there's very few farmers, most people work in banking and finance and retail, right? And therefore they work indoors and they're not exposed to the weather and the stuff that they do is not exposed to climate change as much. So that is the first reason. The structure of the economy is simply different in poorer countries than in richer countries. <coughs> Second reason, is that uh, poorer countries tend to be in hotter places. Um, and here we see the same result, but now plotted against the current temperature. And what you see is that the positive impacts fall on cool countries, and the negative impacts fall on hot countries. And again, there are structural reasons for that. 
if you're in a hot country then the plants and animals you rely on are already close to the biophysical limits whereas that is not the case in the UK um, and the other reason is that if you wonder what Brighton will be like when it's three degrees warmer you look at Bordeaux you look at Barcelona you look at Marseille and what you notice is that buildings are different right they in the Mediterranean they design buildings to keep the heat out whereas here in England we design buildings to keep the heat in poorly uh, but that is what we do right uh, you see that people behave differently uh, there's more pools out there they have their meal their main meal later at night because actually your body heats up when you eat warm food so you should actually do that in the cool of the night rather than uh, during the heat of the day and all these are sort of behavioral and technological adaptations to the heat so if you wonder how will Brighton cope with three or four degrees warming you can just copy what people are doing in Barcelona if you live in the hottest place on the planet Singapore, Dar es Salaam, places like that you can't copy anybody because nobody lives in a warmer place and that means that all these adaptations you have to invent from scratch which is much more difficult than just copying somebody else right? so that is the second reason why poorer countries are so much more vulnerable uh, and the third reason <coughs> and I've emphasized that before the break is that a lot of the impacts of climate change have to do with climate change but also have to do with the human response to climate change and that is known in this literature as adaptive capacity what is your ability to respond to this um, <coughs> and that depends on various uh, factors um, So if you worry about, if you consider the Netherlands, for instance, and you worry about sea level rise, I think that's not an issue, right? The Netherlands is a very rich country, very well organized country, and they're world leaders in coastal protection, right? The country is already half underwater, but protected by very advanced dikes, and that will just continue, and actually you don't worry about the Netherlands uh, and climate change now if you take another country and in the Netherlands the problem is that you have a low-lying country very densely populated you have floods coming in from the sea you have floods coming in from the rivers you have the occasional big storm coming by there's another country just like that flat densely populated floods from the sea floods from the rivers big storms and that country is Bangladesh and if you worry about sea level rise and Bangladesh sort of pops up in your mind as a country that is usually problematic because the response to sea level rise is major infrastructure work you need to build big dikes so you need to have the technology to do that I know I already argued before the break that that is not an issue because the Sumerians knew how to build dikes so the Bangladeshis know how to build dikes right they're not stupid um, but you also need to have the money to pay for those dikes right and that is more of an issue in Bangladesh uh, than in the Netherlands actually it's not that big an issue modern dike building in the Netherlands started in 1850 and the Netherlands in 1850 was not a whole lot richer than Bangladesh is in uh, 2019 so in terms of just basic spending power there's not a, not, not a big difference and of course the Bangladeshis have much better technology now than the Dutch had in 1850 right this was before the internal combustion engine let alone satellites to feed your morph morphological models right um, <coughs> so that that is uh, not the issue um, but if you're gonna build a dike right a dike is a classic public good if you have a piece of land that sits on a river or on the shore and you worry about floods what you can do is build a dike around your land but it has to be around your land right just building a dike at the seafront is not enough if your neighbors are not building dikes then the water will just flow around your dike and you're just as wet right so you need to build a dike around your land 
unless, of course, you can convince your neighbors to also build a dike, right? And then you build a linear dike, which is much cheaper than circular or square dikes. So a dike is a classic public good. If we all stick together and build something together, it is much steeper than if we all act individually. And um, now those things don't work unless you have a strong government and a capable government and an honest government, right? You need a government that can collect the taxes to pay for the dike, that sort of has the wherewithal to <coughs> hire the right people to do it, and that is honest enough to actually spend the money on the dike rather than put it into his bank account. <coughs> and that is one of the big problems in Bangladesh, of course, that you have a government that is not particularly competent and particularly dishonest, right? And that is the third sort of major component of adaptive capacity. You need to know how to solve this problem. You need to have the resources to pay for that solution. And you need to have a political system that can deliver and wants to deliver, right? And of course, that those three are both symptoms and causes of underdevelopment, right? So these particular problems of government corruption, yes, I mean, we have a prime minister who is not particularly honest and who may have given 150,000 pounds to his girlfriend, right? That is the level of corruption that you would find in the UK. Whereas if you go to a country like Malaysia, they steal 10 billion, right? Um, and therefore, there is no money to spend on dikes and other forms of adaptation to climate change or other things that are good, uh, like irrigation and stuff and what have you. <coughs> so, uh, where are we? Um, the impact of climate change on human uh, welfare seem modest. We have known this since Nordhauser's paper uh, in the Economic Journal in 1991. And, and the largest impacts of climate change are symptoms of underdevelopment and mismanagement rather than of climate change. And Tom Schelling was the first uh, to write this in the AER in 1992, two Nobel uh, laureates. Um, so that is what we know, right? That is what the academic literature tells us. So where does this discrepancy come from between the science and the stuff you hear uh, in the media. <coughs> um, and part of it is uh, a word that I can write but have great difficulty pronouncing, uh, millenarianism. Um, and that is a very long tradition, right? So this is Dürer, the four uh, horsemen uh, of the apocalypse. War, famine, disease, and death, right? Um, Pestilence, I should say, and that. And that is the sort of stuff that you read about in the newspapers, right? So this is just from the last couple of months. Uh, climate change is here and it looks like starvation, right? The horsemen of uh, famine. Uh, deadly fungal disease may be linked to climate change. That's the horsemen of pestilence. Um, climate change is a national security issue. That's the horsemen of war. And death, black house, no, no, the ways climate change will change, right? There's the horseman of death. This seems to be a, just a proper way, uh, or a popular way uh, of telling. Um, and the reason for this is that the old stories are the best, right? Or rather, the good stories are the ones that get old. And if a story that was told in the Torah like three, four thousand years ago for the first time and people are still retelling that story, that must be a good one, right? The book of Revelation, right? That's a good story because we keep on retelling it. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse is one of those classic themes that you can make everybody sit up. And um, so people keep retelling those stories because storytellers want to be Heard, right? <clears throat> uh, so if you're an environmental uh, an environmentalist and you want to 
get donations to keep your organization going and growing and you want to get political influence then your best way of doing that is to retell your the old stories and to exaggerate and to tell people what they want to hear and cast things in familiar terms right um if you're a journalist and you want to sell newspapers then saying that something is the catastrophe of the century will sell more copy than saying it's the catastrophe of the decade then putting a headline in yeah there was some damage but last year was much worse right that's not going to sell you newspapers so these people need to exaggerate that's in their business model right that's how you get attention that's how you get subscriptions that is how you get uh, donations um, <coughs> And politicians, you're only a politic. I mean, the people who go into politics and the people who make it in politics are all egomaniacs, right? That's just a requirement for the job. What better way, what better legacy for a politician than to claim that you're saving the planet, right? I mean, do you really think you're going to get e elected or re-elected if you say, I'm going to solve a small problem no you want to exaggerate your contribution and uh, politicians are all want to be like Bruce Willis uh, and save uh, the planet you've all seen this movie right I'm not just showing my age um, if not you should see this movie uh, because <coughs> Bruce really saves the planet in this movie from a true Armageddon um, <coughs> So that is why people do this, right? Not because they necessarily believe it, or maybe they're useful idiots and they do believe it, but that's how the business model of journalists, of environmentalists, of politicians uh, work. None of that is particularly helpful, right? Here is Ed Miliband, this is just the latest one. Ed Miliband is of course less relevant than he used to be, um, arguing that because of climate change, because of uh, the need to reduce our emissions quickly, the UK needs to be on a war footing. And he said this just last week uh, in Parliament, and this here is him saying the same thing a couple of months ago on the BBC, right? Radio 4, yeah. Is this helpful? Well, uh, war as an analogy for action is very helpful if there is an external enemy and you want to mobilize your population for a short but very pointed uh, and uh, fairly large effort then it makes sense to do this but as somebody said you should only declare war if there is somebody to sign a peace treaty with and who is the external enemy here where do our CO2 emissions come from? From our energy use. And it's not somebody else's energy use that is causing the problem. No, we all use energy. So that is where our emissions come from. So we should declare war on ourselves, right? Get a gun and shoot yourself. <laughs> and then sign a peace treaty, right? Once you've done that. And it's not just energy, another major source uh, of greenhouse gases, particularly methane and nitrous oxide, is agriculture. So it's everybody who eats is the enemy, right? It makes sense to declare war if you think it's going to be short and you need to mobilize people and you need to get their attention if there is Russians out there or Chinese or perhaps Germans if you're a Brexiteer. Um, but that is not climate change. There is no external enemy. We are the enemy, right? We are the baddies. Uh, <clears throat> I should have put in another one. Uh, and it's also not a short-term problem, right? What you're looking at here uh, is a paper that was published earlier uh, this year, coming from the lab of Ken Caldera of Caltech. Um, and what you're looking at is the CO2 emissions into the future. <coughs> Uh, by country and by source 
from existing capital. So CO2 comes from burning coal to generate electricity. And coal-fired power plants have a lifetime of 60 years, on average. It comes from burning gas to make electricity, and uh, those power plants have a lifetime of 30 to 40 years. It comes from the buildings that we have and the, heat, the heating that we uh, put in those buildings. And those heating systems have a lifetime of 20 years, and the buildings have a lifetime of many years, right? Uh, but it's the physical characteristics of the building that determine how energy efficient that building is, right? The material it's made from, uh, how it's uh, designed and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of CO2 comes from transport and cars live on the UK road for 10, 15 years and then have another 10, 15 years of life uh, in Kenya and Nigeria. So there is a lot of sort of fixed capital that only very slowly turns over. And what they do in this exercise is they count up the CO2 emitting stock and then let it sort of depreciate at a normal lifetime. And what you see is that the stock that we have now, not the stock that we're building, the stock that we have, will last until 2060 almost. And then if you start adding the power plants that are being built or are in the design and approval phase, you get to 2070, right? So this is a slow problem. This is not a problem where you say, okay, I've had enough of using uh, fossil fuels, I'm gonna stop using it and I'm gonna do something else. That would lead to enormous capital destruction. Right? That's simply not going to happen. That means replacing all your cars in a few years' time, replacing all your power plants in a few years' time, that means replacing all your buildings in a few years' time. It's not going to happen. Right? This is a problem with a very long and slow lifetime. Um, <clears throat> so a short pulse of action, as in a war, in a blitzkrieg, no. That is not the climate problem. Right? <clears throat> Um, now, uh, political scientists uh, and management scientists call this a uh, so-called wicked problem. And um, it's a terrible word. Um, <laughs> a problem is considered wicked uh, if there's no end to it, if there's no stopping rule. A problem is considered wicked if there's no right and wrong but only better or worse. So it's gray rather than black and white. Um, and if actions have irreversible consequences. Uh, and climate change meets all these um, criteria. Now, as I said, it's terrible jargon, right? Because uh, illiteracy among six-year-olds is a wicked problem. Why? You get a bunch of six-year-olds, you teach them how to read and write, and it takes you a year or two, and then a new bunch of six-year-olds who can't read and write pops up, right? And you can start all over again. That is primary education, right? You solve the same problem for different cohorts of children time and time and time and time and time again. You just keep at it. But you never solve the problem. There is no silver bullet that from now on all children are born with the ability to read and write. That's never going to work, right? So you need to keep solving this problem. Um, of course, primary education is not at all considered wicked, right? So we should never have called this a wicked problem. Uh, but climate change is like this. Because of the very long lifetime of these capital stocks, you're not going to solve it with a major effort between now and the time you leave office at Miliband, or between now and the time you are elected president, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? That is not how it works. It's not something that you solve in a parliament or solve in a presidential term. It is a problem that will take decades or longer to solve. Uh, so no stopping rule. There's good things and there's bad things. 
there's no black and white it can be worse it can be better and you can say well the solution to uh, CO2 emissions is that we're gonna build so-called negative carbon energy that is instead of burning coal we're gonna burn uh, biomass right we're gonna burn trees and as the trees grow they actually suck up the CO2 so we're net neutral right uh, and then if we actually capture the CO2 as it leaves the power plant we can capture it and store it someplace safe and the biggest reservoir for that is to stick it in the deep ocean to stick there's lots and lots of CO2 one kilometer deep in the ocean and then pressure will keep it there and that's fine is that a good solution? actually CO2, the proper name for CO2 is carbonic acid, right? So if you stick lots and lots of CO2 into the ocean, you create sort of a very acidic layer in the deep ocean and everything that would live there has no oxygen because there's uh, CO2 uh, and because there's CO2, it is a mild acid, you can't have a calciferous outside, you can't have a shell, right? You need to have a skeleton. So that's not particularly good for the animals that live there. So it's not good or bad, right? We replace one environmental problem with another. And then if you really want to make a dent in your CO2 emissions, then the amount of trees that you would need to plant would take up the size of India. And India is a very big place, right? And if you're gonna plant that area with trees, that means that you can't grow food there. So you're gonna drive up food prices if you do that. So it's not good, bad, black, white. No, you solve one problem, but you create a problem elsewhere. So there's trade-offs to be made. So in that sense, climate change is a wicked problem. Um, and then yes, it's irreversible. If you stick CO2 in the atmosphere, then some of it will still be there in a hundred years time. And some of it will still be there in a thousand years time. And some of it will still be there 10,000 years time. Uh, so climate change is a wicked problem and the solution to a wicked problem is not go all in and solve it in five years time the solution really is to build institutions that quietly and competently chip away at the problem year after year after decade after decade and that is the solution that we need and that of course does not it does not help much if there's very excitable people out there who demand immediate and rash action, right? Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, started by saying that climate change is not an existential threat. I did say that climate change is a problem that should be solved. And I also said there's better and worse ways of solving this problem, but the current atmosphere seems to be going for the worse uh, solutions. Thank you for your attention.